I'm going to start by sharing a few statistics about Canada's health as a trading nation, and I hope that those statistics are going to concern you, because many of you are business students, and you should realize an alarming trend in these data points. And then I want to end with a reflection about public transit, and I'm going to help make the connection in between those two apparently random thoughts. And I hope that as we go along that path, that you're going to find some ideas that as students will be helpful to you as you think about your own evolution and your careers. And for those who are already out in the working world, perhaps some ideas that can contribute to the way you work more effectively with those that you partner with on a daily basis. Okay, 16 minutes to go. Let's see how I do. Okay, EDC. So the role of EDC is really to support and develop Canada's export trade and international business efforts. We do this largely through providing financing and also insurance solutions. So we're kind of like a cross between a bank and an insurance company. We provide loans and people pay us on commercial terms, the interest for those loans. And we also provide insurance and organizations will pay commercial rates in terms of the premiums that we have for, the, for that insurance. And the proceeds from those activities fund all of our ongoing operations. In fact, from time to time, they allow us to make money and to pay back dividends to our sole shareholder, which is actually the Government of Canada. As an organization, EDC has been phenomenally successful. We set aggressive annual business targets, and as a culture, we've been driven to achieve these targets, often exceeding them, even though at the beginning of the year, they seem completely unrealistic. But the challenge is that while EDC is surviving and thriving as an organization, Canada's capacity as a trading nation has been faltering. So here's the data points. So the number of Canadian exporters, and this is a chart from our internal research group, it, it peaked in 2004 at 42,500, but it's now declined in 2008 to 39,000, which is a full thousand below where it started more than a decade ago. And if you take a look at the subset of exporters, those with sales over $5 million, so more robust, more active exporters. The figures are even more startling because there's been little to no growth in their numbers over the past 10 years. And for new Canadian exporters, the news is actually a bit worse. 50% of them cease exporting after their first year, and 70% cease to export after four years of efforts. And when you think about this drop in the number of Canadian companies that are trying to export, you can imagine how that negatively impacts Canada's future trade performance because it just reduces the pool of candidates that can grow into larger exporters and have obviously a positive impact for the Canadian economy. So trade enhances pro productivity and prosperity. And the trade performance of a nation can be measured by looking at that country's total exports and total imports against the GDP of the nation. So in Canada's case, our current total imports and exports are running around $750 billion against a GDP of approximately $1 trillion. And this view is known as trade penetration, and it gives a picture of the level of trade activity within the country, and it's generally seen to be a leading indicator of economic health. It speaks to the competitiveness of that nation's economy. And if you look here at Canada's trade penetration, what you can see is over the past decade, it's been decreasing steadily. It climbed beginning in 1990, but it's now sitting at only 68.5%, having fallen from its peak at 85% in about the year 2000. Now contrast that blue line, which is Canada's trade penetration, to the red and the green lines, which reflect the trade penetration of our major trading partners, including the United States and some other G7 nations. And they're not the G7 that we spoke of earlier, but these are you know, top trading nations around the world. And in their cases, they've seen their trade performance climb, while Canada's has decreased. So now back to EDC. So if Canada's trade competitiveness is declining, we need to be an even stronger partner for Canada and for Canadian trade than we have been in the past. We need to be better than really good as an organization. We have to actually be great and become a high-performance team and a high-performance organization. We need to identify and unleash the unreleased potential and capitalize on that within the organization for the benefit of the greater Canadian economy. That's actually why we exist as an organization. So we started to look at the issue of corporate culture, the question of corporate culture, and what kind of culture actually exists in a truly high performance workplace. And as we looked at that issue, and some of you may have seen um, the Globe and Mail a couple of days ago, 
had an insert that focused on Canada's best workplaces and talked about the aspects that those workplaces are focusing on and need to be increasing. And they reference things like innovation, productivity, and collaboration. And those are the same points that we landed on as an organization and realized that if we were actually going to be a high performance culture, unleash that additional capacity and support Canada as a trading nation even more than we already do, that we were actually going to have to have three essential elements in our workplaces and in our culture. First of all, we were going to have to have a high accountability for business performance. You can see that measured here on the one axis. And also high levels of trust and collaboration. And so in an environment where you have both high accountability for business performance and high levels of trust and collaboration, you get up in that sweet spot, the upper right hand corner of this two by two matrix, which is the high performance culture. And when you layer on top of that, a commitment to innovation and continuous improvement, you end up not burning out, but of course being able to re-contribute and sustain in terms of that high performance culture and environment. So we took this model of the top two by two, and we took the labels off, and all we left on were the labels for number one, accountability for business performance, and number two, trust and collaboration. And we asked the employees in our organization to measure where do you think we are? Where are you as a team? Where are we as an organization? And without exception, they identified very, very high levels of accountability for the business performance, but low levels of trust and collaboration. So we weren't in that sweet spot. We were sitting in a command and control kind of factory environment. So I'm not trying to suggest that we didn't have any trust in the organization or that there was any kind of problem in particular. Keep in mind we're a financial institution and our roles are all about risk mitigation, right? Identifying the risk, avoiding it, understanding what could go wrong. We're perfectionists. We don't like to make mistakes and we don't like to have unmitigated risks. We also don't like to admit or acknowledge vulnerabilities. And that's a challenge if you want to be in an environment that has higher trust and collaboration. So I hope you can see where this is leading. We want to be in that upper right hand quadrant and we want to be the strongest partner in trade for Canada that we can be. But to really become that high performance organization, we might have to focus on that trust and collaboration thing. And in doing so, we might have to take some personal chances and show some vulnerabilities to each other. And that just doesn't feel very comfortable when you're all about risk mitigation. So you might ask how we're walking through this. What are we actually doing? And we built some frameworks and some tools, which I appreciate are kind of HR speak words. And I don't mean to overuse them, but frameworks are important to organizations. They help you see where you're going, and the tools help you actually get there. And for an organization full of financial analysts, well, we kind of like frameworks and tools as well. So the cornerstone for us of the frameworks and tools that we've developed were to map out these three key components of a high performance organization. Against those, we identified some new behavioral competencies that we developed to support those three elements of a high performance team. And then some operating principles that suggested how we agree to work together differently to create that high performance team. And to show that we were on a journey, we actually created a map that talked about the path that we were on and how we would actually get there. But we still really came back every time to that trust thing. And how do you reinforce for an organization of 1,200 financial analysts and those who are focused on risk mitigation, how do you help them understand what trust is actually all about? It's a fairly nebulous concept and it may not come naturally to them. So we found in some of our reading this great book called The Trusted Advisor by three very insightful individuals named Meister Green and Galford. And they somehow figured out how to represent trust as an equation in a very simple and straightforward manner. And an equation, well that's really cool because we're talking about 1,200 financial analysts and they know what an equation is they can figure out how to deal with that thing. That's not so nebulous. And so as Meister Green and Galford explain, trust is credibility times reliability times intimacy over self-orientation. They had broken down the elements and it wasn't nebulous after all, it was something tangible. And as an individual, I could look at that and I could say, well, how am I doing on those elements? 
And what might I have to improve to actually develop better trusted relationships? What component of that do I really need to work on? So we've been sharing this model with our, all of our staff. We've been asking them to do some very, very tough self-analysis, to step back and ask themselves what, how they're doing with the folks with whom they want to build trusted relationships. So do they think they're perceived as being credible? Are they actually reliable? Do they do what they say they're going to actually do? Can folks count on them to deliver? How well do they actually know the person with whom they want to have that trusted relationship? Do they understand what's important to that person? And when they engage with other people, are they really in it for themselves or do they see the broader team or corporate objective that they're trying to achieve? So we have 1,200 employees and we're asking each of them to reflect on the elements of this equation and to do some really tough self-analysis and think about what they have to do differently to maintain trusted business relationships. Some of the questions that they have to ask themselves are really tough ones to consider. When you have to ask yourself about self-orientation, and if you had to do this in your own lives, in your personal lives or in your business lives, imagine what kind of mirror you have to hold up to yourself to do that analysis and to ask yourself whether, when you're engaging with that person, whether you're doing it because you see a greater good or whether it's because you want to get ahead and want to be personally recognized for having achieved something. And if you can't see where you're falling down in these aspects, but yet you're still not getting into that sweet spot of the high performance culture, you know that something must be wrong and you've got to ask for some feedback because if you can't see it yourself in the mirror, you've got to have somebody else help you to see it. And imagine what kind of courage it takes to reach out and ask somebody, to show that vulnerability in a perfectionist environment, to give them that feedback, to help them understand, well, what do you see when I engage with you? Have I been credible? Have I been reliable? If not, why? I want to get better. Show me what I'm not seeing. But that's tough to ask for in terms of feedback, and it's probably even tougher to give. Because for years, these folks have not been having these conversations. And if you think about this in your own business environments, your own personal lives, I guarantee you can think of examples where there's feedback that you should be giving someone to help them improve upon their ability to have a trusted relationship with you, but you're holding back. Because as Kermit the Frog would say, it ain't all that easy being green, right? So here's where we come to the uh, public transit idea, and we bring it all together. And I have three minutes and 55 seconds left, so so far so good. So I, I don't know how all of you get to work every day. I used to live in Kingston, so I have an idea. I'm going to guess most of you drove, right? You drove by yourself or with a spouse or with somebody else who has come to the same workplace. And I think that's how it's done in Kingston, because it's just not that big a city yet. But I live in Ottawa now, and it has a great public transit system. And so I take the bus to work every day. And on my daily commute, I might listen to my iPod or reflect upon the day ahead of me. But often, if my eyes glance up, I look at the advertisements on the bus as well. Because what else are you going to do in public transit? And the ad that has always stuck with me the most is one that's about a helpline, right? One of those numbers you call when you're in distress and you need to talk to somebody. And the language in the advertisement is something about, think about the hardest, the most difficult thing that you've ever had to talk to somebody about or to tell them about. And then the next sentence it says, now turn to the person sitting beside you and talk to them about it. And it struck me as I looked at that ad one day that in a business context, that is exactly what we're asking all of our employees to do right now. We're asking them to let go of that perfectionist tendency where nobody can be wrong to step back and do that really tough self-analysis, to reach out and ask for help, to acknowledge where they haven't been perfect, to try being different, which in and of itself is phenomenally difficult and makes us all feel very, very vulnerable. And it's a journey, really, for 1,200 people of individual self-awareness and reflection, and it's tough, tough slugging. It takes time. I think for us, the good news is that even though it's hard work, in my organization, we have 1,200 folks who want to get there because they really care about this and they believe it's the right thing to do. And as an organization, we're committed to being the most knowledgeable, the most connected, and the most committed partner in trade for Canada. And if we can't get to that upper right-hand quadrant, if we can't release that unreleased potential between the command and control factory environment 
and the high performance team, it's going to be awfully tough for us to be a stronger partner in trade for Canada to help, as our president would say, create trade out of thin air. And that's what we're trying to do. It's kind of like magic. But to be a magician, you got to bring your best game to the table. And that's what we're working on right now. So one minute and 20 seconds left. I hope that in sharing our story, which is, as a friend of mine would say, the bark on version of the cultural transformation that we're trying to go through as an organization, that there's some nugget in there that's meaningful for you. And it may be in a personal relationship. It may be in a business relationship. It may have to do with the way that you want to run your own organizations. This is the challenge that we're facing right now. And I hope in sharing our story, it's helpful to you as well. Thank you. Thank you.